Welcome back to the Reading Fun in the Sun series. So we are here for our review, and this time it's going to be an article. And this is something that um, I was actually forwarded recently, and I'm really excited to review it with you. And the title of the article is uh, Consumer, Commercial, and Industrial IoT Insecurity, specifically talking about attack taxonomies. So the thing is, if you don't really understand what's in your data, how do you make decisions on it? And if you don't have different categories of things, how can you determine the severity of an attack or what kind of attack it is? There's a lot of confusion in this space, especially with the IoT infrastructure. And because it's shared, having a shared vocabulary would also be really helpful to this space. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in. All right, so let's start out with general principles of IoT and why these attacks are even being discussed and why taxonomies are even involved. So I'm going to shoot something up on the screen here, which is a figure from this paper. It's highlighting how a home assistance attack would happen. So in this case, a malicious person is uploading code that doesn't really look malicious. It's really um, a precursor or a backdoor even to actually make a security breach happen. That unmalicious code gets put into uh, a store or somewhere where you're going to buy a device. All right, well, then you buy that device. Now that malicious code is just, you know, it's not there yet, the, the precursor is. It's just sitting there and wait like a spider. And then the bad actor, who knows how to basically enact the, the back door that they've put into your systems can turn it on and start to eavesdrop and they can listen to you. And when you're you know, telling your husband what your social security number is or you're telling your kids what your uh, bank account number is, they can listen in on that. All right, so this taxonomy is essentially broken up into a few different categories. I honestly would not technically call this a taxonomy. I think it's more of categorical data. And honestly, it's begging to be a taxonomy. There's a lot of detail in this article, and I really encourage you to go and read through all of the details because I won't go through them all in this review. But it really needs to be a real taxonomy. <laughs> so the way that it's set up is there are three main categories, and these are disciplines or um, areas that are affected by IoT, and that is consumer, commercial, and industrial. So consumer is focused on end user applications, things like your smartphone and your smartwatches, but also the things that those connect to, like your thermostats and your cameras and your smart lamps and other things around your house, like your heaters and refrigerators. There's so many things that are now connected with IoT in your own home. Then there's commercial, and that's really referring to things more like in the workforce. Uh, these would be health monitoring systems, like your big HVAC, um, smart city deployments, transportation with like um, autonomous vehicles, that sort of thing. And then there's industrial, and that's that's some of the bigger things that are out there. So these include um, those sensors, actuators, and controllers in industrial assets. So, you know, giant uh, manufacturing plants or in giant airports. Uh, also looking at like power plants, which there's definitely been some attacks on power plants in the past. So those are the main categories that they are defining here. Now, the reason that they came up with these different categories or, or super classes, if you will, is because this article is shedding light on the rest of the research uh, space where there are apparently, and it even says this in the article, that there are many taxonomies already out there for IoT, but most of those are focused on specific use cases. What they're trying to do with these three categories is show that this taxonomy can be used for multiple purposes. The other thing that they did point out quite a lot in the article is that a lot of previous studies were labs, right? They didn't actually look at real use cases, real attacks that happened in the world. They were just talking about them in generalities. So this article actually does go through very specific real world examples of all of these cyber attacks. So if you are interested in that, definitely go and read into it. They did a great job at summarizing all of these use cases. I believe there's about three different use cases for each type that they have. So it's a really good read if you wanna check all of that out. And they came up with their quote unquote taxonomy terms or 
you know, classes or children of those categories by doing a literature review from a number of prominent IoT research um, areas from IEEE to ACM, those, those same things that we're all probably reading if we do anything with IoT. And they were looking at journal and conference proceedings from 2014, or I'm sorry, 2015 to 2020. And that's essentially how they grabbed the terminology. Now, the thing I had an issue with here is didn't necessarily say, they did say that they used the key words from those articles, but does that mean that they ignored what the authors themselves used in the article? Because the keywords and the words used in the article, as we all know, are different. So I'd be very interested to know how they address that. The other thing is, as previously mentioned, there are other taxonomies. And I'll put that up on the screen here so you can see the table from, from the article. The thing is, why didn't they map those in? Why didn't they assess the taxonomy that was already existing out there in the world? They had to basically recreate it themselves. So as much as they're talking about interoperability, I, I would argue that maybe the first step would be to map all of the taxonomies together that already exist and then create these super classes and think about that structure. Then again, I have a whole video linked up above that talks about that. So after they got the taxonomy terms, they then started to map real use cases to those different attack types. And I'm going to put here on the screen what those attack types were based on their literature review. Now, what they did was they took the different attack vectors and they explained how those were exploited. And then they also in the article explained how those exploitations could be avoided. Here's my beef with that. It's all textual. They do say this is a taxonomy, and yet I find no references to an actual machine readable or human readable taxonomy or reference. It's almost as if they are using this uh, document as their taxonomy, and I, that doesn't fly with me. Um, I do believe that there should be a companion to this that is a true taxonomy, or maybe it's linked data somewhere. And they don't have to be taxonomists, although it looks like they might need help from real taxonomists. Um, but having it even in an Excel document with some of this detail, I think would be really beneficial. Now, I took a look at some of the other categories that they were describing from the previous taxonomies. And a lot of these definitely look like they are more detailed. I would also say that this might be more of a directional paper, which would then be fleshed out. As I said, if they map some of those other taxonomies to it, I think it would be much more robust. But if you look at these taxonomies and the details that they are covering, I do believe that the granularity that's found in the other taxonomies is better than what's represented in this paper. However, those others are too granular and too specific to a certain use case. So I think intermixing them is going to be really good here too. All right, so we have covered which of the big categories and some of the other taxonomies that they reviewed, but they did some additional granularity in their taxonomy, not as much as the other taxonomies, as I said. They divide this up into device, infrastructure, communication, and service. Now, they claim to have done that so that it is streamlining the approach to categorize attacks in an aggregated way, overcoming the requirement to create different attack classes based on the target, the different security objective. I think basically what they're trying to say here is they are trying to uh, normalize or uh, categorize the generalities so that this model is extensible and people can use it and add to it and it can actually grow, which does make a lot of sense. Now, another thing that they didn't really explain very well is how did they come up with these additional subcategories? I wish they would have gone into that a little bit, but the categories are device, infrastructure, communication, and service. Now, they define device as a category consisting of attacks where an adversary or a bad actor aims to damage or tamper with the hardware components or the things of an IoT system. So more of the physical side of things. The second is infrastructure. So that's essentially the back end and the system data access layer. Uh, it's usually connected to your data storage, your data processing, your VMs, your cloud, that sort of thing. 
Next is communication attacks. And these are really the broadest, and I would say these are the ones that show up in the news the most. These are broadcast exchanges, things on social media, communication protocols, um, any other kind of wireless or physical kinds of communication systems. This is the attack that we described in the beginning of the video where somebody can basically hack into something that uh, you use like Alexa to listen in on what you're doing. Now, I don't wanna pick on Alexa. They've done a lot of security studies on that, but there's a lot of other devices that are always listening in. Anytime you have a voice activated anything, it means that thing has to be constantly listening to you to understand when you actually give it a command. So think about the next time you next find yourself ordering groceries. And the last is a service attack. And again, I would say this one is pretty popular out there in the media because again, it's something that's dealing with things that the end user is constantly dealing with. So that would be, you know, a, again, like a social media kind of hijacking or phishing attacks or something that is manipulating something on the screen in front of you. Now, I think that's really this piece where they actually have the attack vector, the description and example attacks from real literature, from real examples, I think is where, really where this article shines. But strangely enough, they don't take these attack vectors and seem to map it into the larger categories that they have. And that confuses me. I, I do understand that as they are describing each of the use cases, they do explain the different attack vector. But to me, again, that information should be part of the taxonomy. And yet I don't think it's really a integral part of the taxonomy portion, even though this has some of the most detailed information out of everything else here. Because that is something that all of us that do know something about taxonomies could actually use to create one. And if you're doing machine learning, they do mention at the end of this article that one of the security risks with IoT is that a lot of people do not understand the implications of bad data on time series data. I mean, these IoT devices are generating so much data, and yet, no one's really thinking about what bad actors could be feeding into those sensors to basically wreck the models before they even get out the door. That is a real problem. If we use things like this taxonomy to actually train machines on understanding what each of these threats are, it helps with mitigation, it helps triage to understand which attacks are worse than another, and it also helps the machine learn from past experiences i.e. other attacks so that it can be prepared for you know oddities in the future. So the use cases that they go into are quite extensive and I think they did a great job at summarizing them but I'll just go over the main ones here. So for the consumer side of the coin they have voice assistants, baby monitoring cameras and the botnet attacks and those are connected devices of all sorts. So if you have a smart home and you have smart uh, light bulbs throughout your house and smart ports, uh, if one of those gets attacked, it can affect the rest, very similar to viruses and diseases. The next one, uh, and this is under commercial, is aircraft avionics. And I actually know a lot about this one because I was working in the industry at the time when a lot of these things were happening. And it can be, Bad, bad things happen when you're up in the air and somebody can hack into things. Um, however, you know, it's, it can be something as simple as um, somebody hacking in and throwing a, uh, an error message that there is a light bulb out somewhere uh, on the aircraft. And you might think, so what, it's a light bulb? Well, because flying is something that has to be so safe, uh, one light bulb can actually derail and deter your flight from actually taking off on time for hours until they find out which light bulb it was. And because remember, it was a false positive here, it's a hack, there is no actual light bulb out. So they could be searching for this for quite some time. I actually know some folks this happened to, and it is incredibly annoying and it really is very disruptive. And that's really where a lot of these cyber attacks um, have have been successful, unfortunately, is in the small acts that are very annoying, but at scale, like a denial of service attack, it's just so terrible when it affects so many people. It puts us in a standstill and that disrupts so many other things in people's lives. 
Another is heavy duty vehicles. That's the second use case that they are using in this space. And a lot of commercial vehicles, like the big rigs, and you, you might drive around and you see long trains of these big rigs. And that's because sometimes, especially in Michigan, there are autonomous commercial vehicles where the first vehicle will have a real person in it driving, but all the subsequent trucks are driving autonomously and following that first driver. So you can imagine if somebody were able to hack into that, that would be very disastrous. And of course, medical uh, services is definitely in this category. And then there's the, the bigger uh, kind of systems here, and those are industrial. So there is the WannaCry ransomware, where there was a ton of people, millions of people, that had this hack where uh, essentially somebody held your files for ransom, and if you didn't pay them money, you wouldn't get your files back. Um, I, again, know personally some people that that happened to. Uh, there's the Kimura water facility. Actually, there's a lot of different water and power facilities that have had um, different types of hacks. Now, they took all of these use cases and they mapped each one according to the different subclass, and that's, remember, the device, infrastructure, communication, and service. And they did a kind of interesting data visualization on this. Again, I'm not a huge fan. I'd rather have more um, real-time data that I can put into a system for something like this. But they have circles, and I'll put it up on the screen here so you can see, um, that basically indicate how much that subcategory is affected by that use case. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So you can kind of look through across all of the different um, pieces of an IoT threat. What is the highest probability for each of these types? And again, there are real use cases, i.e. research papers that are associated with this. Those research papers are citing other research papers. This is a great machine learning training set for anybody that wants to try it out. All right, and then the end of the research article essentially uh, goes through how some of these things can be mitigated and some of the open questions with IoT. There is so much going on in the IoT space that it's almost getting ahead of itself. And basically what that means is a lot of outdated practices are out there. Legacy systems are not secure. Uh, the uh, security by obscurity, I think you may have heard of this from somebody, that they use a system so old and, and so outdated that no hacker would even bother with it. And while that might be true in some fashion, um, that does not mean it's secure. I mean, it just means that you're hoping that nobody figures out you're using a super old system. Um, unfortunately, I do know the government uses that tactic quite a lot, uh, and that's not good. So for those listening in that sector, please fix that. That's not good. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm like half joking with that. Um, I know that there's a lot of effort being done right now to um, improve security across the board in that space. Um, there's a lot of embedded and default um, credentials, that's another big issue. I know that that's one of the top security concerns um, at a lot of companies too, where a lot of outdated systems, you were allowed to just have an embedded credential and everybody used the same credential and uh, they never updated it and that's just not good. And you know, anything with IoT, they always say that the, the number one main security risk is, is the human element. Uh, end users are all using these IoT devices and if we're not educating ourselves on how to keep ourselves safe um, and how to use these devices appropriately, uh, how to, you know, clear your cookies once in a while, things like that um, are, are definitely needed um, in, in educating people on how to be safer. Now one thing they did also mention is the amount of data that is stored by the, these IoT devices. Um, it's, it's really staggering how much data these, these things have. And the thing is, there's, there's this other thing out there in the knowledge graph space called a personal knowledge graph, which is essentially connecting one person's information across a ton of different uh, databases and spaces. And usually, at least the top ones that I know of right now, are being used in the medical space. Well, you know, looking at this, this security problem and understanding how much is too much and how much is, is MVP for you to do what you need to do, I think is really important for us, especially in areas that involve healthcare, insurance, 
um, you know, general things that involve people and their security. Uh, so I guess that's, that's the, the word to the wise here. All right, so those are my uh, overview uh, and, and reactions to this article. Overall, I think it is a great starting point. I think it's actually even past a starting point, but it definitely needs to go a few more steps farther. Uh, so if anybody is interested in building out this as a taxonomy, I'm all for it. I think that'd be really exciting. That's what I do when I'm sitting on the beach, listening to the ocean, <laughs> thinking about making security threat taxonomies. All right. So with that, thank you very much and stay tuned for the next review and I'll catch y'all later. Thank you. Bye.